And take a seat, and I'm going to call up all the panel members. We have about 30 minutes for the panel discussion, and we're truncating the lunch a little bit. You're going to have a 15 instead of a 20 minute break, and I've been asked to announce that after the panel discussion ends, have the lunch break and then come right back in here and be here for 1.15 so we can start on time. Um, can I ask that the questions for the panel be put up on the um, screen? And these are just suggested um, questions and really at this point we've done a lot of talking at you. Maybe um, we're very receptive to we can begin with questions from the audience right now. Yes. Can you use the microphone? Clearly we're looking at uh, a patchwork of uh, regulations and uh, different local cultural um, practices which are shaped by local politics and history, etc. Is there a scope for harmonisation by way of some transnational bodies? I'm thinking here of the, like the World um, Trade Organisation, perhaps, or the World Health Organisation, World Medical Organisation. We see in other areas of legislation, like domestic violence, for example, which is illegal according to international law, um, where cultural relativism, for example, is not accepted. Um, and there's a debate about the legitimacy of cultural relativism in relation to domestic violence. Would that be feasible uh, to have some sort of harmonisation? And if so, what, what would that entail in practice? Would anyone from the panel be able to comment on that, please? Well, oh, sorry. Yeah, Yeah. Okay. It's okay now. I think that yeah. Um, at the moment, we have a project uh, funded by the British Academy between the uh, group of people at the University of Manchester and my hometown university. So next month, I'm going to UNESCO, and I was talking to Doug about this. And uh, in Mexico, we have adopted international treaties regarding human rights as domestic law. Uh, we have incorporated human rights within our constitution. So any ca in, uh, international regulation which is related to the protection of human rights have the same level as a constitutional right. So all authorities, they, they should observe and they should follow the r international rules. So I was thinking that maybe one way to tackle down the problem of um, prevent stem cell therapy is called the UNESCO. Uh, I don't know, uh, many people are skeptical about uh, UNESCO international declarations, but I think that the, it's the first step to move forward or to have some kind of regulation or control in the area. So I think the difficulty is you are dealing with unbelievable complexity, um, and, and not only unbelievable complexity, but also a lot of money. And those two pieces go together in a way that makes this very difficult to do at a WTO or UNESCO level. My guess is the best method of harmonization is actually through the international societies where they work together with the EMA, FDA, CFDA, all the different groups within that and that they try to work on pathways or even, you know, we talk about multi-site trials in the United States, but it would be a good idea for us to have more multi-site internationally and you'd have to set up organizations that could work with that. Um, but to say you could do it at a treaty level, I'm fairly dubious of that actually working. <coughs> I think the uh, industry initiatives, clinical trials, they are regulated and harmonized uh, in the various world, um, uh, various countries. But the um, academia, in, uh, academia initiated clinical research is uh, very difficult to regulate the harmonize. So I, now the uh, OECD uh, discussion, uh, uh, clinical research, the uh, uh, compliance of the uh, data reliance or the uh, conflict of interest is discussed in the uh, EU and the US and the Japan and the China. So the, uh, but the uh, very difficult because in the, the cost of the clinical trial is very high, so the, uh, now they're discussed. But I think the, um, the Declaration of the health thinking, the IRB, the informed consent of the data reliance is important in the 
I think, than various countries. A very brief comment. I suspect it's not going to be easy to try and harmonize uh, these matters based on a bioethical or generically ethical approach. The reason why I think so is because the declaration of Helsinki, was, which was just mentioned, is in diametric opposition with the belief, for example, that you can take a dying patient, use it for experimenting and charging him. So this is, believe it or not, one ethical view which is disseminated in scientific papers, is di disseminated in meetings and is intended to support the idea that um, you know, the regulating this uh, is done in favor of the patients. What I would think would be an important step would be to make this apparent as a global planetary pro problem. And I fully endorse the view that Margaret just exposed that the scientific societies have a big role in this. I would add institutions like the National Academy of Science or the Royal Society, or in Italy, we have been trying to convince the Academia Nazionale di Vinci, which happens to be the most ancient academic, uh, uh, scientific academia in the world, to make statements and possibly to work on international agendas on these kind of topics. So the, the, the others, oh, go ahead. Just a very, very brief, brief comment, uh, the same, it's very, very difficult. And uh, that, that's why such kind of a international workshop is very important, it should be guide some common signs for each country. And uh, in China, it's a little bit uh, different from other countries. Uh, it's uh, really difficult to lie to the clinical doctor to follow some regulation. They can do what they, they want. Because in China, it's, uh, we have FDA, but we haven't uh, FBI. So <laughs> if, <laughs> if they want to follow, they can follow. If they, they don't like it, they just uh, go ahead without any permission of the government. Yeah. It's a problem. One thing I just wanted to make a comment too, when you talk about international, is there some way to work together? One thing to think about are these international professional societies perhaps setting the guideline. The other thing I recall, um, because history keeps repeating itself, is through history we've had complementary alternative medicines that keep rearing their head all through the history. And I remember at one point NIH had actually opened up an office of complementary and alternative medicine to actually establish at least some principles by which these studies could be evaluated. Um, I don't know if resurrecting something like that or um, thinking about, you know, there's certain principles that are established and maybe there's some kind of a funding agency or some kind of scientific body that actually um, assesses the data. Um, from these types of studies might be considered. A question? Uh, so one of the themes that seemed to be coming up in a number of the talks was this idea that there are, uh, in many cases, economic uh, influences on either rule setting or decision making at the government level uh, and the way that it impacts uh, stem cell regulation in a number of countries. Uh, Margaret, I, at the end of her talk, also mentioned the uh, case of the Dietary Supplements Health and Education Act in America as being an instance where an industry got very well organized and lobbied very effectively for the uh, massive deregulation of their industry. And I think that's something we're starting to see happening, uh, mainly starting from the U.S., but now kind of infiltrating into a lot of other countries. Uh, I think uh, this kind of economic ideology has been promulgated by a number of uh, think tanks and uh, industry-funded institutes in the U.S., so the uh, plan that uh, Paolo mentioned that was presented to the Italian government actually was based on a, a plan for the deregulation of medicines in general, not just stem cells, uh, but that was put forth by the Heartland Institute, which is a, a uh, neoliberal or libertarian think tank. This has been picked up by organizations like the Manhattan Institute, the Cato Institute, the Hoover Institution, which are all associated with this kind of pro-business, anti-government or anti-regulatory uh, impetus. 
And now we're seeing around the world in places like Mexico or the Philippines or Bahamas, and I would even argue in places like Japan, where it's not necessarily individual companies, but it's this government economic initiative, which is, in a sense, sacrificing scientific quality and patient protections to the interests of uh, building business out of stem cells. This is, I think, the real issue that, uh, or one of the, the main issues that we're going to have to address here, is that there is an increasingly well-funded and well-organized movement to use stem cells as a way to attack the existing, the status quo regulatory structure in a lot of the, the countries that we're looking at. Thank you, Doug, for this comment. I would like to add one naive consideration. It was about one century ago when a massive um, increase in the frequency of quackery cases in the U.S. actually led to the birth of FDA and drug regulation. So this is a very, very important lesson because when we think of regulation or deregulation of markets, uh, the thought goes to some kind of social democrat, if not socialist, intervention in the economy. Uh, the drug market regulation was created exactly at the frontier of capitalism. And the reason why it was so is because Medicine is not simply a market, and medicine has one feature which in classical economics defines the failure of every market, which is called information asymmetry. So that is the reason why the drug market is regulated, that is the reason why the profession of physician exists, and the idea of deregulating the drug market is what shows the failure of a certain set of economic doctrines, specifically showing that you cannot deregulate just everything and anything without disrupting something which is important in its own right. So the idea that if you are a dying patient, you have the right to buy any drug on the market, is plain and simply the idea that if you are a dying patient, you are not the subject or the object of medicine anymore. You're just a consumer on the market. And that is a historical change way beyond the impact and the importance of stem cells, or I would say even of science itself, well into the realm of medicine at large. I just have a comment to make, and then and then we'll have the next speaker. And by the way, when you come up to ask a question, if you could just identify yourself, that would be helpful. But I guess the issue we have on the table is these things are happening. Um, do we continue to just sort of um, peripherize it? Do we uh, do something about it, or is there something in between? And I guess. We talked a lot this morning about what the magnitude of the issue is, but regardless of what the magnitude is, it's it's been with us and probably will continue to be with us, and how can we mitigate it to the best effect um, possible? Um, speaker there, go ahead and ask your question. Right. Thanks, Ellen. I'm Michael Warner. I'm Executive Director of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Um, just a couple of things, so picking up on Doug, uh, Doug's point. I absolutely, I absolutely agree that this is not, this is part of a bigger movement, and it is. Um, um, there's definitely, a, obviously, a business and sort of industry piece of this. There's also, it's also about um, medical practice. Um, I think that certainly in the U.S., this is being fueled by a lot of. Um, not only um, uh, companies, but it's really a lot of doctors, particularly orthopedists, who are making the point. Um, I think, Margaret, you talked about it in Texas and elsewhere. This is practice of medicine. This is just like transplant. You know, this is just a surgery. Um, we should be allowed to do this. This shouldn't be regulated. This isn't even about company. You know, that's a company. That's a product. That's different. What we're talking about is medical practice. The FDA has no business being in, involved in medical practice. Um, the organizations are um, pushing lots of state medical boards um, and others at the state level to try to adopt that, adopt that philosophy. There's absolutely big money behind it. Um, and it plays into a narrative of 
uh, kind of an anti-government, um, anti-industry even, or big industry narrative that um, is, is being fueled by some of these think tanks. Um, I told John, and some of you know this, um, I actually had to talk to a journalist once, um, or, or sort of be part of a debate, and in the same conversation I was accused, when I argued that this stuff should be regulated, I was accused of being both a shill for big pharma and a shill for big government, simultaneously. <laughs> So, um, but, but all kidding aside, I mean, I think that really is what, what's happening. At the Alliance, we've developed a code of conduct for our member companies uh, that they have to comply with in order to be a part of our organization, which entails complying with the regulatory um, authorities in, in whatever country they're, they're participating in. So I think that actually, in addition to sort of all the societies being engaged, I think we can't underestimate the political component of this, and we have to be engaged with policymakers and really educate them about sort of the risks and the benefits and the difference between what some people are peddling as stem cell treatments and what a lot of us sort of do, are doing under the auspices of clinical trials or under the auspices of the FDA. Let me turn to some of the questions on the panel, although I think on the uh, slide here, although I think we've um, gotten to many of them, uh, particularly the second one, how does country-specific promotion of local biotech economies affect the ability to regulate clinical offerings? And I actually think we had some pretty good examples during the presentation here. Um, the first one is talking about um, how do you balance, though, the need to protect patient safety, but also allow medical innovation to be able to move forward? At the end of the day, the regulatory bodies, although part of their mission is to advance in innovation, the basic part is to protect patients. It's a consumer protection agency at the end of the day. So how do you, do people in the panel have thoughts about things that maybe are within our control now in terms of trying to figure out um, that balance and uh, what we might be able to do with the tools we have in hand now to get at that. This is more brainstorming. We've identified a lot of problems. It'd be nice to talk about what people think might be some possible approaches. I'll simply comment that, to the best of my knowledge, the purpose of regulation is specifically patient safety. So it cannot be the balance of patient safety with anything else. I'd also like to take this opportunity to make one comment that I find the use of the word innovation somewhat disturbing because it, you know, it really conveys the confusion between science, technology, and development of a product. Innovation is a category of business. Invention is a category of technology. Discovery is a category of science. So it's not the purpose of science to innovate products. It's not the purpose of science to generate the iPhone. It's the purpose of science to make quantum mechanics, which is what makes the iPhone possible before the late Steve Jobs. I guess the point I was trying to get at, though, is stem cells are different than typical drugs and monoclonal antibodies, and it just seems that we're applying drugs and monoclonal antibody criteria to a, okay, I won't use the word innovative, very different uh, type of product, and how do you adapt to a different type of product? Yes, um, a lot of people use arguments like, well, it would have never been possible to develop bone marrow transplants with, in the face of present day regulation, which I think uh, leads to the answer to your question. We have to be very clear that regulators, I suppose, but they will speak for themselves, I guess, are heavily influenced by the environment in which they operate. So obviously, uh, 
you know, the fact that there is a market, that the fact that there is a market of unregulated therapies, and the fact that most of these therapies are specifically offered as drugs has an impact on regulators and downstream of that also has an impact on those people who are very numerous, who genuinely want to develop new procedures, new ways of intervention in their patients, even from the clinical arena. But I think that the thought is somewhat delusional that that can happen in a vacuum. The environment in which Donald Thomas developed bone marrow transplant wasn't the environment in which current stem cell therapies are developed. So much so that bone marrow transplant di didn't become a commercial product until perhaps Emacord. Uh, thank you. Uh, Harvey Feinberg, I have a question that I would be interested in the response from each panelist because we've had wonderful overviews of the regulatory environment in five settings. Obviously, in each case, a need to balance and to decide how to manage the integrity of science, the needs of patients, the interests of safety, the interests of new innovation in health. My question to each of you is, if you could improve one thing in the regulatory regimen or implementation in each country, what one thing would you want to make better than it is now that's already in place? So I get to go first, but good news is I told you what I thought my most important slide was um, and didn't talk about it. Um, I think the crux for the U.S. at least, and I, I think this really is unique to us because of the structure of our law and regulation, is that minimally manipulatable piece, which is a proxy for safety. Um, and the question is, what proxies do we integrate? And I think bench science is going to be crucial to this because we need to figure out what the pathways are. Part of the problem is we don't actually fully know how all of this technology, the cells work in the body. And if you actually did know, you could actually develop pathways. Regulatory science is going to have to follow the science to some degree. Um, but I think what there needs to be, uh, and there, there, this exists in the FDA, so I don't want to say it doesn't. It doesn't exist in the public. Um, this understanding that regulatory science is not a bunch of lawyers getting together and figuring out what the rules need to be. What they're trying to do is work together to develop pathways that, dare I say it, do allow innovation in the best safety uh, framework. And, um, I think part of what we need to do is protect that process by making it more public, but also realize that it is under major attack at this point because there is a perception that any regulation is going to thwart innovation. Um, so I think that's where the, it's people like uh, Michael Werner's group that working with the FDA, we. The public isn't seeing it, but I think it's a crucial piece in, in trying to understand how the regulatory science, it's a separate science, actually, and uh, that needs to come to the fore. The one thing I, I just wanted to add to that is I know at CIRM we regularly meet with the FDA because they see us as a neutral third party. We're not a company. We don't represent companies. And so they actually look to us as a convener to help um, exchange information about the science because they're very thirsty for this type of information and they can't, um, for whatever reason, call these meetings. It's better if it's done by another party to do it. And so we can call industry and academia to come together into a room and we put together webinars with them. We have workshops like the one we just had in September. And so I think if they could do more of those, um, perhaps they're limited by resources, but I think that would be a wise use of their resources to try and have these very interactive discussions. Um, 
Uh, I think the, the regulatory side is very important. And uh, six months ago, uh, I have a, a discussion in Washington, D.C. with uh, Erin and the, uh, Masayo Takahashi doctor and the, and the um, uh, NOH Mahendra Rao, the FDA's reviewer. So we discussed the IPS regional seat. So the, uh, for example, the IPS cell is a possibility of the tumor zenicity. Uh, it's a very big problem. And, uh, it's uh, possibility becomes a cancer cell change. So, but the, it's very um, uh, high, a uh, long period and the high cost of the, the safety of the IPS cell. The, but on the other hand, the, the patient demands a very, uh, um, demands a regenerative medicine. It covers the very severe disease, the uh, regional, uh, severe deficiency and the cardiac uh, uh, <coughs> disease, the very severe type. So the, uh, the regulatory science is uh, the make the guidance, the academia and the FDA, the early communication, the made the, and the review the guidance, the judge, judge and the decision of the approval, the early phase, I think. So. I Dr. Medina? Yeah. Yes. I think that in Mexico we need to improve the agency that we got so far because we have um, many regulations, many law, ma many regulations that deal with human subjects research, but also we need transparency. Transparency from the medical sector, from this big business. So I think that sometimes as long as the patients know that they are part of experimental treatment, sometimes we have problems in order to recruit patients to be part of clinical trials, for example. There's a good opportunity to get some people into clinical trials in order to get discoveries, but we need transparency of what is going on. And also the Mexican agency, it's not, um, doesn't have many um, economic resources. So it doesn't have well-trained human resources. They don't know the science. So even though if, if medical doctors uh, register any clinical trial, they don't know how to evaluate most of the time. And I have talked to some of the agents, and, and that is one of the problems. So we really need to improve the agency that we got so far in order to better regulate the area at, in, at the same time facilitating the discovery of, uh, uh, of new knowledge. And uh, I, I think today the, we are talking about uh, regulation, but uh, it's not uh, real the, the topic for regulation. When, when we make any decision, most important thing is we need to make the balance. What is the benefit and the risk? But it's very difficult. To, to say it's good or not. Because uh, this morning, many people mentioned about the Baker, the biotech tech company. As declared, they already have more than 10,000 clinical application. I go to check the registration document when they sign to the government. No any details about the case report. It means no details you can evaluate it's good or not. It's just to declare there's some benefit, but no people know it's true or not. No people know it's uh, what's the background. So in the scientifically, we have to, to think about whether it's uh, the back, what is the real balance from the benefits and the risk. And uh, another thing is important. You must confirm your scientific uh, achievement by the clinical trial. How to make the balance for the science and the application. It's also a very important issue. That's why I think such kind of international workshop, we need to make some conclusion about the international, some, some project, at least uh, accumulate all the case report together and analyze in a scientific level to see what's the real balance. Otherwise, it's very difficult. I, all the people coming to you say the, always say the, if they want to push this aspect, they will say the good aspect. If they want to stop that, they always say the bad aspect. So we need a real situation. 
real information, real background, and we need all the people coming together to analyze and make a conclusion whether we should go ahead. In, in my personal opinion, the single most important measure at this specific time is to make sure that it doesn't happen that people are allowed to market unproven therapies. Downstream of this, the room is created for regulators to work more closely with scientists. And if that implies working more closely with scientists who are also a commercial enterprise, that is okay. But the way must be found to prevent that this ends regularly in a regulatory, regulatory capture kind of thing. And the third thing is trivial but is not, is to make sure that regulatory bodies can work more rapidly and efficiently on the processing and approval of all that goes under their attention. And uh, Dr. Weisman's been, if it's a short question, Dr. It's Weisman? It's a short one. Uh, first, I think that what's come out from this, not only about this is an issue that no single country or state in the United States can solve without the others being involved because the entities move. Second is that, as you've all said, it involves not only going from proof of concept to IRB overseeing, independent IRB overseeing trials and FDA-like regulations, but it has to include medical licensure and however a country does it, going after people who are promulgating false advertising. Now, the scary thing that's come out of this panel, not all of which I knew for sure, is the depth of the political and financial support of the other movement. And I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll ask Margaret to, to make a comment, but I'll just say something from my own scared reading of the Texas Medical Board. The Texas Medical Board, um, at the behest of a group of people, the governor and a company in Texas, changed um, the issues of how one could do, quote, stem cell therapies, if stem cells were a drug. And they were very clever that they said, well, you don't need FDA oversight, but what you need is a really good IRB. And then they listed three IRBs that everybody on earth would say, that's about the best you could imagine. How could you do better than that? And then the fourth one says, an IRB approved by the Texas Medical Board. And then they included language that if a Texas uh, uh, medical doctor carried out a, a trial approved by an IRB, that doctor could charge commercial rates during the clinical trial, and the doctor could not lose his or her license, even if it proved to be an unproven therapy. So, that plus the three names that Paolo brought up, who were at the highest level you could imagine, Arnold Kaplan, Michael West, former FDA commissioner and NCI chief Andrew Eschenbach, trying to help promote a deregulation for financial reasons, is my guess, is a very scary thing. These are not minor entities. This is a major move. Thank you, Irv. And on that note, we're going to end this session and uh, break for the 15-minute lunch break. Yes. Lunch is just outside uh, the doors. If you pick it up, please bring your lunch back in here. We'll be reconvening at 1.15 exactly to start again. <laughs>